Expression Blend makes it very easy to work with the Visual State Manager. In fact, many user interface designers find the Visual State model much easier to work with than triggers, even though triggers are more powerful. The limitations of Visual States turn out to make it possible for Blend to provide designers with just enough guidance to make their lives easier. To illustrate this, I'll define a custom template for a checkbox. Here's a checkbox with the default template. Incidentally, the default template still uses triggers. Older versions of WPF didn't support the Visual State Manager, and Microsoft didn't feel the need to replace all of the existing controls templates just to use the new feature. The old ones work perfectly well. So if you're hoping to get some examples of how to use Visual States by looking through the default templates of built-in controls, you're out of luck. That's why I'm going to create a new template rather than editing a copy of the default one. Blend gives me a grid to start with, and I'll split it into two columns, one for the check and one for the caption. I'll just drag a content presenter into the right-hand side. That's the content taken care of, so now for the interesting part, the graphical part that will reflect the state of the control. I'll create a rectangle to act as a sort of box to hold the tick. I'll round off the corners a little, and I'll draw a tick with the pen tool. I need to tweak that a little. The default join style for a path is a mitered join, and that looks a bit extreme here with this rather shallow angle. I'll bevel it instead. Also, it doesn't make a lot of sense for this tick to have its interior filled in, so I'll turn off the fill property. And for the tick, I'll use a dark green. I think it'll be a bit easier to see at its normal size if I go for a slightly thicker stroke too. OK, that's not going to win any awards, but it's good enough to illustrate the thing I'm actually trying to show here. I'll switch to this tab here. The title has been collapsed down, but if I mouse over, you can see that this is the States tab. And in here, Blend has discovered and listed all of the visual state groups and the states they contain. We'll see how it discovers this later. So you can see the mouse-related states I described earlier, and the check states here, and so on. There's also this pseudo-state here called base. This isn't really a state. It's just the thing you select in this list if you want to edit properties in the normal way. If I select one of these other states, you can see that a message line appears here above the artboard with a small HAL 9000 graphic that's supposed to represent a sort of recording light, telling me that any edits I make right now will only affect how the control appears in the mouse over state. If I'm editing properties that should remain constant regardless of state, like the color of the tick, then I don't want this state-specific mode, and so I can select base, which puts me back into the normal editing mode. I'll start by making the tick invisible. It should only appear when the control is in its checked state. So here in the base pseudo state, I'll hide it by setting the opacity to zero. Then to make it appear when checked, I select the checked state over here in the states tab. The status line appears to tell me that I'm now making edits that will only affect the checked state. So now I can put the opacity back up to 100%. I'll try this out now by running the project. That might be a bit small. It was nice and clear in Blend because I'd zoomed in. Let me zoom back out. I'll wrap this checkbox in a grid. And then I'll apply a transform to the grid to scale it up by a factor of three. I'll run again. OK, that's a bit easier to see. If I click the checkbox, my green tick appears, and if I click it again, it goes away. Going back into Blend and getting back into the template editing mode, I can tweak this a bit. I might not like that sudden instantaneous transition between states. Most of the controls in Windows use animation to make transitions a bit less jarring. And that's easy here. Blend lets me specify a default animation transition time for any transition in the group. If I want to, I could get more specific, but this will do for now. I'll overdo it just so you can see the animation working even if you're watching this course on one of our more heavily compressed mobile formats. When I run now, you should be able to see that the tick fades into place, and it fades back out again when I click a second time. 
That's unusable, of course, because such a slow response time will only irritate the user. You'd pick a rather shorter animation time for a real application, but the basic technique is sound. Now I'll edit state changes for a different state group. I'll select the mouse over state, and then I'll edit the box behind the tick. I'll make it go purple when the mouse is over it. And then for the pressed state, I'll make it go blue. Again, I'll set a relatively slow transition animation. Running again, as I move the mouse in, it gradually goes magenta, and then as I push and hold the mouse button down, it gradually goes blue. When I let go, we now see two state changes happening. The controller's moved from the pressed state back into the mouse over state, but at the same time, it's moved from the unchecked to the checked state. So WPF ends up running two animations one for the tick and one for the box. And by the way, even if you don't use these slow transitions, all state specific property editing turns out to use the animation system. Let's look at the XAML. Here's my control template, and here's the grid at the root of it. Visual state transitions are all set inside this attached property called Visual State Manager Visual State Groups, which must be applied to the root element of the controls template. This property contains a collection of visual state group objects. These must correspond to the state groups offered by the control. We'll see how the control advertises its state groups later, but for now, just be aware that we don't get to define new states here. Only the control can decide what states it offers, and how they're grouped, and when to transition from one state to another. Blend has a mechanism for discovering the state groups, and it ensures that the XAML it generates here matches what the control supports. It only adds visual state group elements for the groups we've chosen to edit, but inside the groups, it generates a visual state for each state the control defines, whether we've done any editing for that state or not. So here you can see two visual state group elements, because I edited properties for the mouse related states and also the check states. But although I only modified properties in the mouse over and pressed states, you can see it has added a visual state element for all four states in this group. Every state that I edited contains a storyboard. Remember that I told Blend I wanted the rectangle to change its fill color in the mouse over state. Well, this is the visual state element for that state, and its storyboard contains a color animation that targets the color of the brush in the fill property of that rectangle. You can see it's using a keyframe animation. That's not really necessary for the very simple animation I've designed, but if I wanted to, I could build a much more complex animation for a state change. One of the reasons the Visual State Manager uses animations is that they compose well. The animation system is designed to support many concurrent animations and has rules for what to do when multiple animations attempt to target the same thing. This is what makes it possible to define the appearance for each state group independently. The composition-friendly nature of the animation system means that we don't need to create 42 separate appearances for the checkbox. We just draw the initial base appearance and then define variations for individual states as required. So there are four mouse-related states, normal, mouse over, pressed, and disabled. And since the base appearance is just fine for the normal states, we only need to draw three variations for that group. Likewise, for the three check states, checked, unchecked, and indeterminate, the base appearance is OK for the unchecked state, so we just have to draw two more states. So that's a total of five states on top of the initial base appearance, and the Visual State Manager can combine those to produce 12 different appearances. And if we were then to define another change for the unfocused state, that would effectively double up those 12 states into 24. Although remember, that includes three combinations that the checkbox will never actually enter, because the disabled state prevents the control from acquiring the focus. And then if we define two appearances for the invalid focused and invalid unfocused validation states, the Visual State Manager could combine things together in 72 possible ways. But again, the control only ever uses 42 of the possible state combinations. But for those 42 combinations, we've only had to draw the base appearance and eight variations. The Visual State Manager has exploited the composability of the animation system to produce all 42 combinations from our eight variations. Triggers are at least as powerful, of course, 
we can run animations and change properties as an upshot of any property on the control changing, and those will combine together just as easily. But the handy thing about this state model is that Blend presents us with a fairly simple list of states. Graphic designers tend to find this much less daunting than having to discover for themselves which triggers are the ones they want.